What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Ham Radio Crash Course. Welcome to the YouTubers Ham Fest. We're winding it up here. I think I'm one of the last ones, and Jason Ham Radio 2.0 is going to close things out. We're going to be talking about oscilloscopes today, specifically why you might want or might not want an oscilloscope for your ham radio journey. I have a very special guest, somebody I've wanted to get on uh, the, on the show here for a long time. So we're going to get that started really soon. Thanks again for clicking on the show. All right, let's kick it off. How's it going, everybody? Again, thanks for clicking on the Hammer to Crash Course. Really do appreciate it. We got a lot to talk about, so I'm going to really move through my normal opening pretty quick. And appreciate that this our, my normal show is a bit different than this. So everybody that's watching, thanks so much for sticking with us through this weekend. Gosh, we had over 40-something videos this, week, uh, this weekend. Just awesome. Uh, this is Memorial Day weekend, so I want to give... A moment here to just say, you know, thanks to everybody who served uh, the country to allow us to do what we're doing and obviously take a moment tomorrow and consider someone probably in your family, extended family that we have lost um, due to, you know, various events. And so just want to say thank you for the service and uh, make sure you take some time tomorrow and appreciate that. All right. Well, we're going to be talking about oscilloscopes. And I have George from the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast to jo join me. Before we get to that, though, I want to remind everybody that we do have a shirt this weekend for the YouTubers Ham Fest. I don't know if Leia is going to pull this thing or not. It may be on a timer. And uh, yesterday she made a <laughs> a new shirt, which is a arc reactor, but it's a 49 to 1 un, -un. So if you're a, an Iron Man fan, <laughs> it's a pretty cool uh, thing she did. Pretty smart. Okay, let's kick it right off because we've got a lot to talk about. I am with George Zafropoulos. Did I get it? <laughs> or I screwed it close. up. Did, uh, hey, Josh. Uh, say it again. Zafiropoulos. Zafiropoulos. That's okay. I, 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 I default. My brain defaults, and I know you corrected me beforehand, and I totally butchered it. I am sorry. Uh, George is with the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast. Everybody should be listening to this podcast. It's absolutely fantastic. So, George, thank you so much for coming out on the show. Uh, anything you want to mention right up front before we start talking about oscilloscopes? Well, first off, Josh, thanks a ton for having me on. I, I'm honored to be uh, included in this. This is really exciting. So happy to be here. And um, talking about test equipment is something we do on the podcast a fair bit. So uh, happy to be here to talk about that or any other technical stuff. Yeah, I, uh, I listened to your podcast and you guys start breaking into the test equipment discussions. And it's like, I want to understand what they're talking about. I wish I knew this better. So I'm, I'm mainly doing this show for myself. And I've just brought, you know, 100 or so friends along with me to, to, to watch this as well. Uh, because I find this topic fascinating, interesting, and I want to understand better what it is uh, that oscilloscopes do and why we might want one. So maybe we'll start with that. Can you give us you know, the, the ham radio high level uh, kind of explanation of what an oscilloscope is, and then we'll talk about why you may want one. Sure, uh, an oscilloscope, like, like we just said, is a piece of test equipment, and why would you want one? Uh, if, if you are the kind of uh, ham radio operator that likes to build things or fix things, then having an oscilloscope could be an essential piece of test equipment for you. It's probably one of the most basic, important pieces of test equipment you can have in your bench, but it depends on the kind of work you do. Uh, basically what an oscilloscope does is it gives you a graphical picture of a signal. And so that is shown as, um, as a two-dimensional graph uh, where the, the horizontal dimension is time. So you're sampling the signal over time yeah. and the vertical dimension is voltage. So you're just looking at voltage over time. Okay. And that's we're going to get into it, but that's where you would see the classic sine wave, right? That's the, the variation, yeah. the oscillation displayed over time. Very fast. Uh, K6ARK, thank you for the super chat. That's amazing. He says, awesome topic, Josh. It's to Ham Radio Workbench, best podcast out there. Okay, oh. maybe tied uh, with, with my wife's podcast. <laughs> that's a, thank you, Adam. Very funny comment. That's awesome. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, so yeah, we've got uh, time. So you're, you've connected to something, a circuit under test. You are displaying basically what again? 
Okay, so you're, you're looking at, again, a voltage over time. Well, what does that really mean? So if you, if you think about like uh, audio, let's say if we were to take an oscilloscope and hook it up to the microphone here, you would see the envelope of what my audio signal looks like. Okay. So as I speak and my voice gets louder and softer, then you'll see that modulation at very voltage coming off the microphone. Or if it was going to a speaker, you'd see that voltage level change mm -hmm. and you could see your voice. So this obviously kind of makes sense if you were to just sit down and you wanted to like homebrew a circuit, right? Um, but maybe most hams don't start out there. I think at least from, from where I kind of got my first exposure with the scope was after I screwed up a kit I was building, right? And the, the tip was, well, do you have a scope? And well, no. And they're like, well, you have a multimeter, uh, but that's only going to give you part of the information. And I didn't really understand why multimeters kind of like, you know, probe it, that's the voltage, boom. Why do I, why would I want to take that next step into this oscilloscope territory? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And the reason is that some signals are very simple and some signals are very complicated. So if you're, if you're looking at a simple signal, like I want to look at the, the voltage of my battery, mm -hmm. I don't need an oscilloscope. I could use an oscilloscope, but it's not going to tell me anything because my battery is 13.8 volts and it's 13.8 volts right now. And in the net for the next 10 minutes is going to be 13.8 volts. It's not going to change. Sure. So a voltmeter will tell me that perfectly fine, very simple to use, just tells me what the number is. If I looked at that same voltage with a oscilloscope, it would just be a flat line. And that would be a vertical elevation of 13.8 volts on the display, mm -hmm. but it would just be a flat line. So I'm not going to learn anything by looking at an oscilloscope uh, for, in that kind of a measurement. If you're looking at something more complicated, like, like uh, let's say a um, the output of an audio amplifier, if if I'm listening to an amplifier and I think you know, gee, the amplifier sounds kind of noisy. If I put a voltmeter on it, that will tell me nothing. It, it mm -hmm. won't really enlighten me at all. If I put a scope on that, however, I could see the the signal envelope and I could see if there's noise on that signal, mm -hmm. uh, and it'll start to help me figure out what's wrong with it. So, so an oscilloscope really just gives you a much higher fidelity view of, of the circuit. And so some things make sense for a scope and some things just don't. Okay. And then, um, so that's more on the debugging side of it, right? So you just explained, you have some device under test and you think it's supposed to work this way, um, but it's not right so that's why you would use a scope but you got me um i don't know what i'm doing i know how to solder and i know what the components are and i can read a schematic so i bodge all this stuff together and then i'm looking at it in the table and i go well i put all this stuff together and it's not doing what i think it should be doing how would i use a scope to kind of help me figure that out well that you, could, you could yeah sure i mean you're really just talking about uh how do you debug a circuit and mm -hmm. It may be that a scope is the right instrument to use to debug the circuit. It could be the voltmeter is the right device to use, or either one in some cases. There, and there's other instruments that you might want to use also, like power meters and things like that. So those are all different kinds of common test equipment that you could use to debug a circuit. Depends on the kind of circuit. So if you're if you're debugging a a, a audio circuit or a digital circuit then uh, an oscilloscope is probably appropriate because those signals change very rapidly and seeing them visually will help you debug it. Whereas if it's a constant voltage, like I just said a moment ago, the voltmeter is fine. Or if you're looking at a, the output of your transmitter, then RF power meter is going to be more useful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, right tool for the right job. But the debugging process is the same. Um, you know, you really start with uh, where do you see the symptom? So you think you have a problem. Well, you start at the point where that problem is noticeable. Right. So let's say, for example, you've got a receiver, you turn on the receiver and the audio sounds distorted coming out of it. Well, you know that at the speaker, the audio is distorted. So basic debugging technique is you start at the speaker and say, okay, is the speaker working or not? Obviously, if you could disconnect the speaker, hook it to a known good audio source, and that sounds fine, then the speaker is okay. Mm -hmm. It must be something in front of the speaker. Um, and then this is where having the schematic is handy because you could look sure. at the schematic and say, all right, I'm going to go to the speaker on the schematic and work my way backward. Right. So what's in front of the speaker? Maybe there's a capacitor. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put my, my scope in front of the capacitor to see if the audio getting to the capacitor is distorted. And if that's distorted, then, well, what's in front of that? Maybe it's an audio amplifier chip or a transistor. So maybe I'll put my scope probe in front of that. So I'm going to kind of move backwards mm -hmm. through the circuit until things look correct. Um, and sometimes what's tricky is sometimes what fails may cause a symptom. 
but like for example you may have a device that gets shorted and causes another device to not work properly so you have to also start to isolate some of the sub circuits if you can you know right. cut a trace unplug a wire or do something to separate the sub circuits and so you can test them individually is that just the nature of some of the components being parallel to each other or, or running um it's not so much parallel it's that they interconnect so like let, like a, a good example is you might say um let, let's say you have this audio amplifier and let's say the audio amplifier stops amplifying mm -hmm. well what could the problem be the problem could be that the final amplifier let's say it's a transistor could be the transistor's bad it could be that the power supply to that amplifier stage is bad it could be that the the driver stage before the amplifier is bad mm -hmm. so what you ideally want to do is start to isolate those pieces of the circuit so if i could disconnect the power supply and measure the power supply to see if i've got the right voltage coming out of the power supply then i know it's a good power supply so that's not the problem mm -hmm. if okay. if i disconnect with the driver stage and insert a signal and it's distorted then it's not the driver it's probably the amplifier it's probably the transistor and the amplifier so it's really a matter of of like working backwards disconnecting circuits where you can now obviously if you have a surface mount board with a bunch of teeny weeny little parts <laughs> doing this may not be possible right and so you know this is why like you just send your radio back to the manufacturer to have sure. them fix it or and they're not even to fix it they're going to throw out the board and plug in a new board because it's cheaper right so uh if you have an older radio with discrete components and you have leads on those components, which, by the way, if, if you ever want to do restoration, it's way easier to restore old radios because like tube radios because they have real wires and it's literally easy to physically disconnect and test things. Sure. That, those scare me, though, because it's literally just like a rat's nest of wires and components sometimes shoved in the cabinet. And you're like, oh, yeah. I don't know if I want to even look at this thing. Um, so interesting. Well, maybe if you could, maybe you could demonstrate a little bit about what this looks like so uh, let's say we had you you mentioned audio so let's maybe see what that looks like and then we can talk about it a little bit further as we get some questions and by the way we are looking at the chat so as we go along if you know george has brought something up that you'd like to have answered uh just tag me at ham radio crash course and i'll try and add it as we go along so let's take a look george okay so uh, there's a lot of different kinds of of oscilloscopes these days mm -hmm. so there's there's a, the kind of oscilloscope we all think about. It's a box with a display and a bunch of knobs, um, which are very common, very popular. Uh, there's also nowadays uh, USB connected devices. And so what I'm gonna demonstrate here is a USB connected oscilloscope. So what I've got is, is this thing here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is called an analog discovery by a company called Digilent. Uh, the thing plugs into USB on the back uh, with a little micro USB there. And then the front of it, has got about a 30 pin header connector. Hopefully you can see that. Those look like GPIO pins kind of. Yeah, right? exactly. And then, so you can either stuff wires into this or there's okay. a little daughter card that you can plug in that looks like that. Oh, cool. It has BNC connectors on it. Um, and so you would hook up your scope probes to this. I, I happen to have one wired up on the bench here. The, the, there's two of them. Okay. So um, the, the thing that's really different about these, it, it, one is not necessarily better than the other. We could talk about the pros and cons of the box instrument versus these PC connected instruments. Um, I use them both. They both have pros and cons. I find myself using this a whole lot more uh, these days than a traditional box instrument. And the reason is that the whole uh, presentation of the of the display and the control is all through PC software. And if the PC software is written well, and they're not all written well, by the mm -hmm. way, but if it's written well, it's very easy to use and gives you a, a lot more features than you could have in a boxed instrument for the same price. So in fact, th this little guy is, um, is a two channel oscilloscope. We can talk about what the, that means in a bit, yeah. but, but it's a two channel scope but it also has a two-channel signal generator built into it. And by signal generator, it's an audio uh, or low-frequency signal generator, not like okay. an RF signal generator. But sure. um, this is really multiple instruments in, in one. And so because uh, we're doing this over Zoom and there, there's PC software to control this, it's easy for me to just pop up a window. And I'll show you the control software that controls that instrument here. Excellent. Yeah, let's take a look. So let me uh, That's let me another share. reason why that's a good uh, device to use because you can connect it to a computer and if you're doing a live demonstration like this, you can go right into it, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, can you see the, the screen yeah, okay? Yeah, looks great. Okay, so w what you're looking at is, is two windows. The way the software is written for this device, you can have multiple windows and you can scale them and you can 
um, you know, panel them and move them around. And you can also save the setup. So if you have a project you're working on that has a certain combination of like signal generators and scopes and things like that, you can set up the different uh, windows and then save that and then reload it without setting everything up again. So what you're looking at here, the top window is the oscilloscope window and the bottom window is the signal generator window. So um, just to kind of, let's talk about the signal generator first because we're gonna source that uh, before we see it. So down on the bottom, uh, it may be uh, difficult to see because the text is rather small on Zoom, but on the left-hand side uh, on the bottom pane, uh, there's a little triangular button that says run. We're gonna hit that in a second here. Um, and then next to it, there are some parameters. So you can tell the signal generator to generate a sine wave or you know a nice um, sounding pleasant wave. Uh, and then you can tell it what frequency, you can tell it what the amplitude or voltage level of the signal is um, and some other factors. And then the top uh, window is the oscilloscope. So um, you, would, you would shove the signal in there and it would show you again the voltage in the y-axis, the, the vertical, and then over time on the, uh, the bottom horizontal axis. Now what I'm doing to, to illustrate this is I'm just taking the output of the signal generator and shoving it back into the scope. So that way we can watch exactly what the signal looks like that we're generating. So I, I also probed this signal and stuffed it into my, uh, my mixer. So when I generate the signal, you'll be able to hear it. Uh, let's see, so let me go ahead and turn that on. So yep. I'm, you can hear that I assume? I can, yeah, so I think everybody can hear that. Okay, so that's a one kilohertz sine wave uh, that's, that's currently set up. And then I'm gonna hit the run button on the oscilloscope and it was frozen before because that was just the last sample from when I was testing it. Mm -hmm. So now you're seeing that sine wave live. So to prove that it's live, uh, I can go down to the, to the signal generator and I could put my mouse over the frequency box and I could either uh, pull it down and select a frequency like, like uh, let's say 500 hertz, or I could just scroll my mouse wheel over that frequency and just dynamically sweep through the frequencies or I can move down to amplitude and I could change the, the level of the signal. So you can see it go up and down there. So, um, so that's the, the basic controls for the signal generator. So you notice on the screen, on the, on the scope, when I was changing the audio tone, you can see how for a given sample rate, the, the waveform squishes together right. because you've got more cycles per second. Mm -hmm. So in fact, if you go down to like, let's just go to a kilohertz, if you look, at, let's say between two of the peaks on the on the screen, mm -hmm. if I bump this to two kilohertz, then what happens is you'll see twice as many. Right. Well, because it's twice the frequency. So boy, boy George, this basic. sounds a lot like RF. <laughs> yes. Is there a well, parallel yeah. to RF in here? Funny thing, there is actually. <laughs> this is actually a very good demonstration that my wife is watching right now. So this is fantastic because she's always asked me about this, and this is a perfect way to demonstrate it. So thank you. <laughs> sure. Yeah, actually, this is really fun. I mean, the first thing you do when you get something like this, um, the, one of the reasons I recommend these kind of devices is because they have the signal generator and the oscilloscope. Oh, yeah, that's and fantastic. And even, even if you don't have a, like a circuit you're playing with, you could just generate the circuit and play with it. And so what, what's really useful is like, um, you know, we, we talk about de debugging. Well, what if you hear distortion? Mm -hmm. See, the beauty of the oscilloscope is you can actually see distortion. Right. So, so right now I'm, I'm creating this beautiful sine wave and it sounds very pleasant to the ear, right? <laughs> right, right. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna mess this up a little bit. So, so I can change the type of signal uh, from a sine wave to a square wave. So now yeah. you can see, see, listen to how raspy that sounds. Mm -hmm. So nothing changed except it went from a sine wave which sounds pleasant-ish, to this raspy sound with the square wave. Does that do sawtooth by chance, or that, that becomes more to like a synthesizer at that point, I think, uh, right? Well, you, you can actually. So there's built-in standard wave shapes, uh, triangle, uh, ramp, which is a sawtooth. Um, yeah. You do ramp up, ramp down. You can generate mm -hmm. random noise. Uh, you can generate pulses, uh, trapezium sine power curve. The other thing you can do with the software that, that's harder to do with the, the fixed instruments is you can create your own waveform. So you could you can create an, uh, what's called an arbitrary waveform, which means that I could describe the, the amplitude at any point in time, and I could create that with Excel or with a, you know, a program I wrote in Python or whatever. 
and I could just upload that uh, series of points into the software and just play that. Mm -hmm. and, and I could play it over and over and over again or just one shot through it. Cool. You can also sweep, by the way. This Now, this gets to be a really useful thing. So I had a project I worked on uh, this last uh, a year ago that was building a, a, a new uh, repeater controller circuit. And one of the circuits in it is a PL decoder. And so we were uh, part of the PL decoder and the PL filter was to figure out the roll off of the PL filter. So if you just generate one audio tone and measure its amplitude, that's not really useful. You want to sweep it. So you want to sweep from like zero hertz to let's say 500 hertz mm -hmm. and see what the roll off of that that looks like. So with an instrument like this, you can do something a little bit fancier. Like you can go from a from a a, a, a single signal to a swept signal. Okay. And I could I can say well, okay I want to sweep from let's say is starting at 10 hertz going up to a kilohertz and I want that to change every uh, so many milliseconds I want to make it a smaller signal and so what is we, that so how would I so again going back to the I don't know what I'm doing I just built a kit and I screwed something up <laughs> How how would I use this information? Okay. That's a great question. Well, first of all, this is this is like you you just want to make sci-fi woo woo. Songs. Well, no, this is so, this is killer for that. But I still have a yeah. broken radio. What am I supposed okay. to do? Well, it, you, you're going to get distracted for an hour or two making woo woo right, sounds. Right, right, and once right, you're right, done right. with that, right. then you're going to go back and play with the deep. Like, okay, so so let's say you've got your 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 uh, your audio. Uh, audio is just a great example because it's, sure. it's kind of simple. Yeah. So okay, I, I'm getting distorted audio out of my uh, amplifier coming out of my radio. Uh, one of the things you want to look at is is maybe you want to generate a tone and and, and sweep it from uh, a low voltage to a high voltage. In other words, low volume to high volume, and you want to see at what at what signal level does the does the amplifier start to distort. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing you might do is a frequency sweep, where you might say, okay, for a given signal level, I want to start at one frequency like even zero hertz and sweep it up to maybe uh, three or four kilohertz. And and see if the audio output level uh, remains the same, or, or or at what frequency it distorts at. Because mm -hmm. when you do these kind of sweeps, now you're kind of exploring the range of signals, the okay. range of amplitude, the range of frequency, and I can see under what circumstances does this thing not work right. Okay. And once you see that, then then it's like, okay, is it always is it always noisy under all circumstances, or only under some? So like an, one example I've seen is um, you you might. Um, put a low level signal into an amplifier, like hundred millivolts and it sounds great. Mm -hmm. and, th and then you put in half a volt of audio and it gets really distorted, but it shouldn't. Well, what could be causing that? It could be mm -hmm. that your power supply is not supplying enough current or maybe somehow that audio signal is being rectified because maybe there's a bad capacitor or diode or something in the circuit that's causing it to rectify at a higher voltage so a lower voltage squeaks through and it's okay, but a higher voltage, it gets messed up. So, you know, being able to see that range of frequencies and amplitudes lets you figure out, okay, under what circumstances do I have a problem? Okay. Audio, I think, is, a, is an easy example to get your kind of, your, your brain arms around it to start making sense. But then if you're talking about like, what what's another circuit within say a kit radio or something you're building? That uh, you would... A really common thing is is going to be digital uh, signals here. So uh, what would be? Let me go ahead and stop this frequency sweep thing. Um, so digital uh, uh, signals are really really common. Mm -hmm. um, you know one one thing is like let, let's say you have a, a radio and a serial port on the radio, mm -hmm. and you you know you, you get your software all set up and you're sending commands to the radio, but the radio is not responding and you've gone through all of the configuration things and you think it's all right, it might get down to the physical connection, could be something bad. Mm. So you could take your scope probe and you could look at the, uh, the signals, the TTL or five volt signals or the RS-232 signal or even the USB signals. And you can see like, do I even have any signals here or not? So you don't necessarily have to decode what they are, but you might wanna see like, you know, if I press a key on the keyboard, and I never see d data of some kind going to the radio, something's wrong in my software. Sure. So you can use it for a very simple kind of like debugging in that way. Or let's say, um, you know, is the oscillator, I've got a crystal in my, my circuit. It, it could be like a, in a digital circuit, like a crystal in a microcontroller circuit. Mm -hmm. Is that oscillator oscillating or is the crystal defective? I can probe the crystal oscillator uh, circuit. And if I see the 10 megahertz crystal or whatever it's supposed to be, 
then I know the crystal is at least resonating. And if I don't, gee whiz, maybe my crystal's broken. Oh, perfect. Okay. Because I, I mean, that's so that's a that's a receiver stage of your radio. I'm assuming then on the transmit stage as well, you can get an oscilloscope involved, depending on sure. where the where the issue is. Okay. Sure. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, there's a question in the chat. They were asking what what are you using right now, and you're using the digital. Uh, what was the the discovery? This thing. It's a Digilent Analog Discovery Two. And it's a USB device that plugs into, you said Windows, Mac, and Linux. It'll run with pretty much anything, right? Correct. Is, yeah. Do you have to download software for it, or is it all in the box? Uh, you download software off their website. The software download's free. You can go download the software right now and play with it uh, if you oh, don't cool. have a device. They have what uh, they have a demo mode. Uh, you, you, when, you, when you run the software, you can have multiple devices uh, hooked up to your computer, mm -hmm. and you can select which ones you're going to control. So if it doesn't find one, it says... I can't find a unit. Do you want to run the demo unit? You go, yep. And cool. then it gives you kind of like a, a phony one to, to virtual one to play with. Um, and, and by the way, we, we don't, um, I mean, like, it's not like we don't sell these things. We, we don't, they're not even a sponsor of our podcast. Right. I just love their stuff. Um, they did give us a, a, a discount coupon, by the way, if you really get excited about this. So um, these things are between about three to $400. And okay. uh, they're they're If you go to their website, and you search for ham radio workbench, um, there's a bundle price that gets, gives you like 130 bucks off the bundle. Oh, okay, cool. So it's, it's a good deal. I think we added, uh, George was kind enough to provide a series of links. They are in the description that provides more context to this as well as links to the ham radio workbench. So make sure everybody avails themselves of that. So, okay, I, I'm getting it more. Um, <laughs> I'm, un I'm understanding better, uh, if that's the right thing to say. Uh, I definitely have had problems with uh, crystal locked radios where that that would have been a helpful tool because, right, a multimeter is not going to tell you anything at that point, which going yeah, exactly. back to, yeah. That makes sense. Okay. We're, is the we're, oscillator oscillating? You don't know. Uh, it, and if you have a synthesized radio, the synthesizer is putting out a signal, and you want to see is it putting out a you know the correct frequency or the correct uh, you know amplitude or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, I I played around with spectrum analyzers. I'm a bit more familiar with spectrum analyzers, and I'm always playing the attenuation game. I'm trying to attenuate the signal that it's under test to make sure that I'm not going to blow up my spec an right. Yeah. What do you have to do with a with an oscilloscope to make sure you protect it? Don't blow it up. Okay. Same same kind of ideas. Is there a <laughs> yeah. certain voltage input that once you pass that, it's like you're you're going to kill something? Yeah. All of these uh, devices, whether they're these little USB connected ones or the boxes, they all have a maximum uh, set of maximum ratings, like a maximum voltage. So something like this, I don't recall off the top of my head, but it's like 30 volts. Uh, as a maximum voltage, um, you, you oh, don't want to okay. you don't want to use it to probe around inside your uh, you know your tube transmitter with uh, you know 300 volts in it. That'll kill it for sure. Um, now you you can also do voltage dividers and stuff like that to scale the DC voltages. So just like with a voltmeter, you could put you know a couple of resistors in front of it and scale it. Okay. Um, it. It's kind of a coarse way to do it. I mean, but for most 12 volt radios, you're fine then. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Very good. Um, yeah, why don't we, uh, you got some slides, and I think that might help if we take a look at some of those. Sure. I've got questions um, as we go, but yeah. Oh, well, let's talk about that really quick. There's your workbench. <laughs> Everybody likes a good workbench pick. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the workbench. This is almost in a state of cleanliness. Um, this is kind of almost between projects here. It. So, yeah, Thank so it. you can see, like, I have a couple of different scopes, like right in the middle there. Um, in the middle, on the bottom shelf next to the orange voltmeter, uh, there's a Rigol scope, which is a pretty modern uh, uh, digital, well, it's analog and digital signals, but it's it's got a digital display. Uh, the scope above that with that kind of blue screen, that's an old-fashioned pure analog um, um, oscilloscope. So they both do a great job. They're a little bit different in their features, but similar idea. You can't see the analog discovery because it's too small. <laughs> <laughs> right. Very good. Okay, cool. Um, so, just some scope basics. Um, this is a, a simple oscilloscope. This is a Siglent uh, uh, model. Siglent is a really good brand. Um, I think for most hams and most you know DIY electronics people, you don't necessarily want a big fancy complicated scope with a million knobs and buttons because you're probably never going to use most of that stuff. You're only going to use the the basics. I at least in my experience. I mean, I've done this for a long time. I rarely ever use anything uh, beyond the basics of these these uh, units. So you really don't need something very exotic. So that's kind of the good news. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we already talked about uh, about what it does and uh, why you'd want one, which is really for debugging stuff. I mean, that's the essence of the purpose of this. So when you're using the scope, there's really uh, very few things you got to worry about. Um, you have to be able to uh, plug your probe into it so you can poke at the circuit, right? That's the basic thing. So there's usually a BNC connector that's the input from your probe. So there you can see on this uh, Siglent model, there's two BNCs next to each other, all three actually. One says X, one says Y, and one says external. Uh, one is channel one and uh, two is channel two. So there's two identical channels in this unit. So you can look at two signals at the same time. And then the external uh, trigger BNC is for having a synchronizing signal that you rarely ever use. You can for certain applications, but generally don't. Uh, so there's really only two controls you ever do uh, adjust. And that is each channel you'll adjust the vertical axis, which is the voltage range. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there's one off to the right there that says um, time range select. So this just selects the scale of the time. And um, the reason that you have that is that you might be looking at a signal that changes like our one kilohertz signal. It changes um, a thousand times a second. So you want to, you want to, to look at the signal, um, you zoom in enough on the signal so you can see a few oscillations. Now, okay. if you also had, let's say, a, a clock oscillator that was oscillating at 10 megahertz, well, that's a lot faster. And if you looked at the 10 megahertz signal, it would just look like a bar because there's so many transitions. It's all you know, I, squished okay. together. I'm, yeah, so uh, this would be like your TXCO kind of thing, right? It's it, it's it's like your um, – it's a, it's a zoom <laughs> – Think of it as your zoom knob. Okay. You're zooming in and out of this of this oh, of the signal. Sorry, I meant that when you said clock circuit, you're talking about something like a TXCO or yes. uh, something to maintain time in the radio. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. Exactly. Or your synthesizer in your receiver or transmitter. So you're uh, saying the megahertz of the oscillation, you will have to adjust the zoom to get you any kind of intelligibility of the actual sine that's wave or whatever wave it is that it's putting out. That's right. Because okay. because if you if you if you go too far to one end, you'll just all the lines will just write over each other. It'll be a big blob, and if you go too far to the other side, it'll just be like a straight line. So you need to find the happy medium where you can actually see the signal and have it make sense. So so those are the only two things. It's just adjusting the vertical and horizontal axis. And oh, okay, and uh, there you go. Um, the other buttons are you know you leave them alone. I mean you generally don't touch anything. <laughs> That's about it. I, I guess that makes it uh, an easier tool to use then, right? If you, even, although you have lots of options, you as a ham, we only need a few of them. You're saying, yeah, and not just as a ham. I mean, even even in in a commercial, um, you know, lab settings, mm -hmm. you often don't use more than those. I mean, ninety percent of the time, you just use that stuff. Um, there's some some of these scopes, the more modern ones like this, will also give you optional digital information like. Um, you could press a button and part of the screen, since it's an LCD panel, part of the screen would be replaced by uh, a banner with numbers, which could show you, for example, for channel one, what's the highest voltage you ever measured and the lowest voltage you ever measured and the average voltage. And so it could do a bunch of mathematical uh, calculations for you that might be interesting and useful, but and you can like turn that on and off. Okay. Interesting. Okay. I'm following. So it basically, if I'm just if I'm just wanting to look at the audio signal level, screw in the, the the probe, turn it on, set the vertical, set the horizontal, so you can see a signal that makes sense to you, and, and there you go, you're kind of done. Cool. Okay. All right. I'm copying. Uh, and this so, is a, that was just an entry level oscilloscope, right? You know, yeah. I mean, my entry level that doesn't mean that it's cheap or bad. Uh, and well, it is less expensive. What it really means is that it. It doesn't have the, what are the fancier features? So if, if I'm going to go spend 10 times, 100 times more on a fancier scope, like what are you really getting? Right. So what you're really going to get is a higher uh, frequency range of signals. Okay. You're going to get maybe more channels. You're going to get maybe more accuracy. Honestly, accuracy doesn't matter for us. Do but, hams um, need more than two channels generally? No. I, I've, I, I, I have a four channel scope and, and others are all two channels. I never use the four channels. I, I've almost never had a use for that two okay. channels i use all the time oh okay. and i'll tell you I'll, I'll tell you why i'll tell you why i use two channel all the time if i'm doing an audio circuit and i'm generating a signal like we did today mm -hmm. i want to look at the input signal that i'm generating okay. and i want to look at the output signal at the other end of the circuit so i can compare them so sure. to do that comparison i want two channels 
Okay, I gotcha. Uh, at, actually, Kyle in the chat said, I'm assuming you would use a signal generator and an oscilloscope to determine the sensitivity of your RF or, or your HF or two meter rig. So would you use the two channels to kind of probe both of the output of the radio as well as the, the generated signal to begin with? No, you, you wouldn't use a, well, you'd use a different kind of signal generator and you wouldn't use a scope for that. You'd really want to, we need an RF signal generator. So these little um, uh, analog discovery units, they'll generate a signal from, from zero hertz to maybe 10 megahertz, mm -hmm. but they're, they're not really RF generators. They're, they're like sine wave or square wave. We call a baseband generator. Oh, okay. If you want to generate a real RF signal, you really need an RF signal generator. Um, which is a different kind of instrument. Um, well, I mean, could you just pipe the audio into the radio and have it? Uh, so the, the, so signal. The, the signal generator in the 82 could be used to modulate a transmitter. So in that actually, um, I, I've done that a lot for doing like repeater testing, mm -hmm. where let's say you might have an RF signal generator that has a modulated input and you want to, let's say, put a one kilohertz tone through the circuit and adjust the, the deviation or the amplitude. So you could use the signal generator, the audio signal generator, to do the modulation or sweep it. Okay. Um, do that all the time. And then you'd use the scope to look at recovered audio. So you'd, you'd look at the uh, the analog audio coming off the last stage of your receiver. But if you wanted to look at like intermediate stages on a receiver, um, you you may or may not be able to use the scope. It depends on what you're really looking at. Uh, you may need to have a, have a different kind of RF test equipment for that. Interesting. Okay. Very cool. So um, so this is kind of a zoomed up picture of what the analog scopes and digital scopes look like. If you were in the market for a scope, let's say more than about a dozen, 15 years ago, they're, they're pretty much all like the analog scope. They were a CRT, cathode ray tube, that mm -hmm. would project the waveform on that phosphorus uh, surface. And, uh, and that's what we used for decades and decades. And, um, and they, work, they work perfectly fine. Um, as the display technology got better and better, of course, scopes went from being cathode ray tubes to flat panel LCD displays mm -hmm. for all the usual reasons. And, um, and, and that gave you a little bit different visual kind of look and feel, but, um, but you know, they're both very good. The digital displays are a little bit more accurate okay. and the analog displays tend to integrate the signal over time so they look smoother. Uh, just because they're being hit constantly as the scope refreshes. But mm -hmm. one is not necessarily better than the other. Uh, and for ham purposes, they're both great. So you okay. can get good used scopes or buy a fancy new one. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be talking about what we what you would recommend somebody look at. You've already mentioned the analog too, but I'm also curious, like, uh, just a, what your bullet points are for hardware that people might want to feature-wise, you know what I mean, the, what they should be looking for. Actually, let's just hop to that. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of basic specs you look for in a scope. The first thing you look for is uh, what's usually referred to as the bandwidth of the scope. Um, the bandwidth of the scope refers to the highest frequency signal that the scope could represent on the screen without uh, distorting the signals. And usually that comes in the form of what, what you call roll off. So in other words, if, if I create uh, if I create a signal that's let's say at 10 megahertz and I have a 10 megahertz scope, I should be able to see a signal from zero to 10 megahertz and it should look kind of the same on the screen. If I, if I put that, um, if I put, let's say a, a 50 megahertz signal into a 10 megahertz scope, it might show me the, the, the signal, it might not, but if it shows me the signal, it'll probably be attenuated. It won't really faithfully represent the, the voltage measurement. So that bandwidth really tells you what's the highest frequency signal I could look at that is uh, gonna be accurate. So you can find scopes that are 10, 20, 50, 100 megahertz, 200 megahertz, a gigahertz. Um, you know, obviously the, the faster the scope or the, or the broader, you know, bandwidth, the spec, the more expensive. Sure. So, so then, of course, the question is like, okay, well, what do you need? Um, and the answer is actually almost any scope will do for amateur radio applications. Uh, if you're looking at uh, audio, if you're looking at digital signals that are not very fast, like if I just want to look at the output, uh, let's say I have a circuit that's going to key a, 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 a relay. Mm -hmm. The output of that circuit is going to be a transistor. And when the transistor is, is turned on, I, that transistor is going to clamp to ground. And, and, it, and so I'll see like 
a voltage just slightly above ground. If I'm not clamping that transistor to ground, it's going to be floating. And a scope is a great way to see that. You can't see that really very well with a voltmeter. I, well, I, I think you, this came up in the podcast, didn't it? When you were playing with the 705 and you needed the, uh, that circuit you built yes. to pull it down? Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you can just clip onto the transistor lead going to the coil, mm -hmm. and um, you're just going to turn it on and off at like, you know, you're going to change it once every 20 seconds. So mm -hmm. the oldest, slowest scope in the world would be fine. <laughs> okay, right? I got you. So if you're looking at USB, USB 2, you know, maximum rate is like 10 megabits a second to see if there's data there at all. Mm -hmm. Fine. You know, so you really don't need a fast scope. The only time you need a fast scope is if you're saying like, all right, I'm building a digital circuit and the digital circuit has a 200 megahertz signal in it. And I really want to look at that signal. Okay. Then you need like a two, three, 400 megahertz scope, but mm -hmm. who does that? I mean, we don't, none of us do that. So that's the good news is, is actually the low end of the, of the performance spectrum is perfectly fine for us. Okay, cool. That's good. Uh, the next thing you'd find is the number of channels. Uh, they typically are one, two, or four. Um, older scopes, you'll find single channel scopes. Uh, almost any decent scope is going to be a two channel scope. And you can certainly find a lot of four channel scopes, but they tend to be uh, more expensive. And, and like I said, unless you have an application for it, you, you'll probably never need it. So you're, you shouldn't worry about a four channel necessarily. No. Two channels, fine. Uh, 20 megahertz is fine, but if you got like maybe 100 or 50, you'd probably be good. Again, for ham yeah. radio. Yeah, exactly. In fact, you, you almost can't get them this slow. Uh, right now, if you go by the latest, um, you know, kind of prosumer grade oscilloscope, maybe cost you 400 bucks, and it's going to be a 50 or 100 megahertz scope, even if you don't need it. Yeah, I think it, this, it, you're sigilance, just get it. this sigilance two channel, 200 megahertz, and I think it was under $400. Yeah, I think. And, and every couple of years, you know, the performance goes up or the price goes down, like everything. Right. So, right, right. Um, and then the last thing is I look for is like it, it is a is a brand, uh, you know, get a good brand. So the, the traditional brands that that everybody swears by are Tektronics and HP. Mm -hmm. um, HP has gone through three name changes. Their test equipment business um, changed names from HP to Agilent, like a oh. dozen, fifteen okay. years ago. All right. And then like seven or eight years ago, they, they spun out every time they, they spin out businesses, they keep spinning out the test and measurement business from the mothership. So the last spin out, <laughs> uh, the new company's name is Keysight. Okay. So, so you, so HP test equipment, Agilent test equipment, Keysight test equipment, it's all the same thing with different names. So Tektronix, HP, those guys, those are top quality and you can, you can always find good used Tektronix and HP scopes. Um, analog scopes on the market for, you know, a hundred, couple hundred bucks, you know, very good scopes. If you want to go buy brand new, uh, there's a bunch of, there's more, there's more brands. It's like, it's like a lot of things now, you know, there's like a few house names, but you, you know, you go on eBay and you find there's like a hundred companies you've never heard of before that make a thing. Right. Uh, like, like DMR radios. I, I like every day there's five more brand names that, <laughs> You yes. know, of DMR radios. Yes. I don't know who any of these people are, but you know, but you kind of, but you go back to any tone or you go back to Motorola, right? right? I mean, this is like the equivalent. You can't go wrong with a few of the well-known brands. So in that kind of middle range uh, or really low end range is Siglent and Rigol are the two that are, uh, in my opinion, safe, safe bets. They're great companies. They make really good instruments. They're very reasonably priced. Uh, you can buy them from dealers here in North America. They'll support it. They have, uh, I know Siglent has an office in Ohio, their they're, uh, mm -hmm. U.S. office. I don't know where Rigol is located. I think they have an office here somewhere. Okay. Um, you know, you can, you can buy it from tons of sources. I've bought most of mine from a company called T-Equipment. Um, T-Equipment is great. They're, they're super knowledgeable. I called them one day and said, hey, I'm thinking about buying this thing. And they said, why would you buy that? Uh, you should buy this and sit. It's half the price. And I said, well, what's the difference? He said, well, the one you want has the fancy brand name on it. If yeah. you get the cheaper one, it's the same thing because the same company makes it. It's the, oh, it is the same funny. thing. You should buy the cheaper one. I was like, I'm buying more stuff from you. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, they're great. I love that. Yeah. And then now there's this whole new category of these PC instruments because the PCs are so powerful and because you can uh, design the hardware cheaply. <clears throat> uh, you see these little pucks or boxes and now there's a whole spectrum 
of these USB attached or Ethernet attached instruments, you can get them anywhere from like thirty or forty dollars to a couple thousand dollars, and there's there's definitely a difference between them. Sometimes there's a difference in the performance, of course, but the one of the biggest differences is the quality of the software, because just because the instrument is a good price and has good specs, and even if it's good quality, if their software isn't easy to use, then what's the point? Right. I, I wouldn't bother. Right. And so you know, like it's like a lot of um, Chinese radio manufacturers, they're really good on the hardware and like kind of light on the software. Yes. Same thing. <laughs> yes, yes. Same deal. So that's why I like Digilent because um, Digilent's the U.S. company, um, they, um, they make a great product. All the integrated circuits in this analog discovery are uh, from a company called Analog Devices, which is kind of, that's their play on the name. Uh, ADI is a, is a fabulous company. They make wonderful uh, devices, have for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So they're a super reputable, uh, high quality in, uh, device company. Uh, and, the, and the digital and software is really great. So, so there's lots to choose from. You know, the other thing you'll find is, is that a lot of guys have an old scope that we just like to get rid of. You know, like I've got an old analog oscilloscope, a 20 megahertz analog scope, and if only somebody would take it off my hands for free, that would be great kind of a thing. Okay. So, you, you know, check your local ham fest, check your local club, you know, you can always find like free deals. Yeah, I uh, obviously with with last year it makes things a little bit more difficult um, with with going to Hamfest. But every Hamfest I've gone to, there's always somebody that has like five uh, analog scopes that are sitting on a trunk, you know, the back of their trunk, and they're trying yeah. to move them. And it's the same five scopes that he had last month, um, right? So I, I, there's probably deals to be had, right? And it, it, I think, hopefully, this gives people confidence that as long as it's Eh, 20 megahertz even 10 megahertz two channel you're you're probably okay yeah exactly i mean it, like if you look at these old tektronic scopes or hp scopes they're all going to be good enough as long as it's not defective if the thing works ah then it, then it's fine so that was a question that came up in the chat so people were talking about used scopes picking up a used scope how do you know that your scope's good is there a way that you, you test it or check it out is there something you do Yes, it's pretty simple. Um, you you want to plug it in, turn it on, and have some kind of signal source that you can squirt into it and see if it works. And the simplest thing is is some kind of uh, audio. I mean, if you if you don't have a signal generator, you can just take your handy talkie and um, take this you know speaker output and uh, you know with a little patch cord and just clip the the scope probe to the speaker output of your handy talkie. And and have your buddy just talk on five two, and you know, and if you can see the audio modulating on the scope, it's good for free. What do you want? So this this one I have has a a, a test point. That's not necessarily for self test, is it? Uh, that, usually that's a calibration point. Um, oh, okay. So so what you'll do is uh, like on the on the display, it's a you'll see a grid, mm -hmm. and when you set the vertical uh, level, your you, the actual units on the on the scope will be how many volts per division. So if you have, let's say, um, like four little, like eight little boxes going vertically, if you follow. Yeah. Um, so let's say if you set uh, a one volt um, uh, setting, that means each one of those little eight or eight, eight squares is a volt. So you have a eight volt range, usually plus four and minus four, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's way to, ways to calibrate the input to the scope, the, especially these analog scopes. The digital scopes is not such a big deal. But for analog scopes, there's usually a calibration adjustment. So you can take the scope probe and hook it to the uh, the calibration point, which is usually one volt peak to peak. And so uh, it's a way to self calibrate. So you hook the probe to that internal signal generator, and you'll and you'll see the little square wave, mm -hmm. and then you'll adjust the calibrate so it displays on the one little square. Okay. So that's a way to calibrate it. But obviously, if you're um. Uh, if you actually have something uh, that you can put into it under test, like I, I actually like the idea of using a speaker like that. That's something I might try. Yeah, uh, easy way to do it. You know, even better if you have a real signal generator, like if you happen to have bought a signal generator at a flea market. So, you know, you can just take the output of the signal generator, stick it into the scope, and then see the signal. 
Yeah, then you start playing the, uh, I, I don't know if you do this with test equipment where you have test equipment that you used to test other test equipment and then it just starts to become this horrible chain of how do I know this is good and this is good and this is good. Is that a thing that happens with, with hams that collect all these devices? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole subculture of neurotically uh, uh, oriented, highly calibrated test equipment nerds. Um, um, I fortunately haven't fallen into that trap, but I kind of can relate. I feel like I collect radios more than anything, um, but I, I feel like this is a new hole I can fall into um, to, for for collection. I do need a frequency generator. That is that is on my list. So, uh, very good. Do we have? Uh, did you have any other slide you wanted to hit of, of points that came up? Because I've got questions. No, I, but I think this is pretty much the the slide where let's go to questions. Okay, I do want to do something. Um, I'm going to take a quick break from the the topic. Um, I want Carlos to hop in for a second, and I'm hitting you blind with this. Carlos, are you? Can you hop on to uh, video really quick? We Perfect wanted to, timing, Josh. I'm gonna take <laughs> take the screen share off for a second, uh, George. Now I, I'm gonna let Carlos talk for a minute. Um, Carlos did something last night, and he does something that's really cool. And uh, well, I'll just let you explain it, Carlos. Go ahead. So George knows about this already, sort of, kind of. Okay. I've posted a picture of it on his uh, Pactana group. Uh, I did a parachute mobile night jump last night. Not just any jump, a night jump, which in our world is a special thing uh, with a Pactana. Beautiful work. Uh, when I finally got my problems sorted out, the pilot was insane. The signal was beautiful. Uh, if, if, you know... What I'm saying is, I'm not sponsored by anyone. I don't get anything from anyone. If you need an antenna, go buy yourself a back antenna because this thing is awesome. Oh, that's that's awesome, Carlos. When I, when I saw your first picture, uh, when you did the first test of that thing, it's like that sort of blew my mind. We get a lot of pictures of you know here here's my pack antenna in the woods, which are really fun. I mean, we all love to see that, right? right. But when it's like here here's the pack antenna at well, like I don't know how many thousands of feet you're up, you know pre-jump it's like oh my god that's awesome so that was at 11 5 i don't know if, it, uh, if you can if you look at the picture there's a, a little watch looking thing on my wrist and it says 11.5 is 11,500 meters uh, feet meters oh my god i'd be dead by then uh, i wouldn't have any oxygen <laughs> um but um uh we have another jump happening in about uh two hours an hour and a half i hour and 15 minutes from now ballpark so excellent the Pac-10 is going back up into the sky on a sunset load tonight. Uh, I have awesome. Nomad here helping me again, and uh, we're we're trying we're experimenting some new things with relaying the information down to the ground so that I can have a better recording of uh, all the QSOs. Are you going to be on twenty or forty? Uh, we're doing twenty. Uh, do we have a frequency yet? Fourteen three seven. Fourteen point three one zero. I'm just going to so tune there right now because I didn't get it last night. <laughs> Where in the country you might be, uh, where, in the, where, where are you, George? I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay, so KU, KK6USY is in that ballpark as well. And I've, I've talked to him every time I've gone up except last night. And I think it was because last night he was holding off. Uh, so it's a really easy shot. So, may, you know, try to make oh, that contact. That's uh, awesome. I'll have to give it a try. Uh, so Nomad's already cleared, uh, verified the frequency on using web SDRs to make sure everything is clear around the country. Um, the group over at Toads is starting to hold the frequency now. So with any luck in about an hour and 15 minutes uh, ballpark or so, I'll be in the sky uh, making another parachute mobile. I'm also going to borrow a very, very large parachute so that instead of 10 minutes, I get something like 20 minutes of working time. Oh, wow. That's going to be great. Cool. Carlos, thanks for hopping on. I wanted to get that in there before we jump to questions. Thanks so much, man. And uh, I'll be thanks, I'll be guys. listening. I'll be trying to make a contact with you. Groovy. Thanks, guys. Great to see you. All right. Let's go ahead. That is so awesome. Yeah, I uh, I we were we did a live stream kind of ad hoc last night, and uh, we you know walked through his gear. And I'm like, what, you know, what radio, what antenna? And he's like, oh, I run a Pac-10. And he actually has a, a weight that he connects to the bottom of it so that it gives enough drag when he's when he's uh, aloft like that. Really cool. Wow. All right. So let's see what the questions we have coming in the chat. Thanks, everybody. A lot of great comments, great sh stream. Thank you, George, for this. This is really awesome. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Now people want to know about Pactena. Where's the best place to buy a Pactena for my G90? 
<laughs> George? Oh, wow. Free uh, plug. Uh, Pactenna.com. However, uh, we are 100% sold out of all antennas, and which you know, it's becoming kind of a joke. It, it um, is its own trope so I, at this I, point, I, yes. I, I, start, you know, I, th- I start to think of us as a California artisanal uh, antenna manufacturer. Right. So... Um, it's not it's not because we want to be out it's because uh we you know we're a little family company and so we we put out a a, a wad of cash to make a bunch of antennas that we hope get sold and then they sell faster than we we expect and then we, we have to start the cycle again you'd think we'd get onto it by now and, right. and order more but one of the problems we've had is is that uh, we've had some uh, supply chain issues with covid particularly our assembly house which the funny thing is the assembly houses we use are in in the us the, the main antenna assembly facilities in um, in Oak Park, Illinois. And uh, they had some COVID issues with staff and whatnot. So it's, it's kind of impacted uh, their scheduling. But anyway, there's a wad of um, of parts in, in wire, a ton of wire uh, at the assembly house now. And we're making uh, new everything, all, all the antennas and chokes and everything, making new ones. All right. Somebody was commenting on using a scope to check envelope power yeah so you, you can certainly see the envelopes so to do that if you're talking about doing like a pep measurement from an rf signal then you need a, a, a sampler you need a way to actually sample the rf energy and then uh, to be able to uh, rectify it so you can see it uh, on a scope bring it down to an appropriate voltage to display it but that's like the old um heath kit what was it the sb i want to call it the 610 or something like it was like the old station monitor you know you'd have a little like crt circle yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 there's there is a square one that was the station monitor then there's a round one that was like a pan adapter one before pan adapters were a thing really. yes yeah um and yeah so sure you could you could do that so the scope is kind of like the guts of what's inside of that okay um so that's not just something you're like okay it's time to connect my scope to it you you need to have other equipment for that that might yeah, you actually go back to con- blowing your scope up <laughs> yeah exactly you don't you don't want to just screw the the you know don't put a patch cable from your transmitter to the front of the scope unless you want to use it once well you got to be careful with me because i'll just go do it <laughs> i'll just do it uh so i have to be very careful with test equipment um all right now everybody's talking about Pactena. Now you have more people that are going to be hitting refresh on the page to find a, a Pactena. Yeah. Well, we'll have to do something on Pactena sometime. Uh, yes, indeed. that would be a lot of fun. Well, we also have Mike. Uh, K8MRD radio stuff is in the house. You know he's a big fan of, of Oh, yeah. Of yeah, he Mike's awesome. Him. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Mike, Mike crashed our website because of, because of Mike. As soon as Mike puts up a video, it's like, you know, everybody's hitting the website. <laughs> indeed. I need to update my links to um, to the playlist, but there is going to be one more video to cap off this weekend. Uh, it's going to be over at Ham Radio 2.0's channel. I'm grabbing that uh, link and I'll, I'll post it here shortly. Um, George, what else? Where, where's the best way that people can find you? Let's remind everybody to go check out that great podcast. Um, yeah, sure. So uh, go to hamradioworkbench.com. Uh, just uh, you can find us on any podcast player. Uh, you know, Apple podcasts or stitcher or any of those things just search for us uh you'll find it mm-hmm. um either the website or through the the podcast players and uh, we put out a show every two weeks uh we have a new show going live on two not live going uh on the stream on on tuesday all about directional antennas mm-hmm. so uh that'll be fun uh yeah so what are you doing for field day when well, i'll hit you up with this last minute before we wrap things up yeah, we've got a, a small group. We normally do a big blowout um, event for our club, and we haven't done, done that, obviously, for, for COVID reasons. This year, we're just, just three or four of us are going to go to a campsite. We've got four campsites. Uh, we're each going to take a campsite and try to you know get together and operate. So um, I'm, I'm taking a Flex 6400 and a Maestro. <laughs> so it's going to be pretty fun to try that. You know, you, uh, you hit me with the coolest idea. It was last field day where you're like, what if we took all of our flex radios and put them in one location under armed guard? And then we just had everybody remote in from like all yeah. over the world. I was like, that's an idea. That is just a crazy enough idea that hams are going to do it. I'm like, that's pretty smart. Yeah. It's like field day, unlimited class, unlimited. Yeah. 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 I like it. I like the unlimited class. Very good. Um, okay, man, I, I knew we would run out of time. I definitely have more things I want to talk to. So I think we're just going to have to have George back again. Uh, uh, that is no no question on that. George, uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy weekend to come out here. I just posted the link in the playlist or to the playlist, so we're going to go on to Ham Radio 2.0's channel here shortly. But, yeah, George, thanks again. 
Really well, Josh, thanks it. so much for having me. It's really fun. I'd love to do this again. Oh yeah, Thank absolutely. Because you. you know all the things that I need to get much better at. So I'm, <laughs> I'm stuck on. I'm stuck into you now. So <laughs> you'll be back <laughs> anytime, man. Thanks very much. All right, I'm gonna all play right. you out with some memes, everybody else. So you just hang tight. I'm hitting that button. Thanks for watching, everybody. Go to Hamrito 2.0. George, just hang on one minute. <laughs>